Good evening. My name is Joel Allen, and I'm an associate professor of religion and philosophy here at Dakota Wesleyan, and we are glad you're here for our 2020 Stark Lectureship. And you're going to really enjoy hearing from Sarah Calhoun. We've had a wonderful day with her so far. She's spoken in five classes, I think, and then we've had a kind of an open coffee hour and just came from a little reception, and so we've kept Sarah very, very busy. Let me introduce you real quickly to her bio, her bio so you can get a sense for, the, for Sarah as a person, and then she'll come and speak in just a moment. Sarah Calhoun has two decades of leadership experience in both the nonprofit and small business sectors, working in outdoor education industry before founding Red Ants Pants in 2006. She was raised on a farm in rural Connecticut, and, and Sarah was inspired to move to Montana by reading Ivan Doig's book, This House of Sky, which I've read, and it's a fantastic book. So, and from her home in, a small, in the small town of White Sulphur Springs, she's become an inst inspiration to entrepreneurs nationwide and is known for her dedication to supporting rural communities. Tired of wearing men's work pants that didn't fit, Calhoun designed pants that would fit, function, and flatter working women. Red Ant's pants are made in the USA and that will not change. Red Ants Pants is based out of White Sulphur Springs, Montana, where the storefront, distribution center, and entrepreneurial head, international headquarters all reside in a historic saddle shop. Known for their grassroots marketing efforts, including Tour de Pants, the direct marketing business model is proving effective. To show her support for hard working, the hardworking side of Montana and beyond, Red Ants Pants Foundation was also born in 2011. The foundation supports women's leadership, working family farms and ranches, and rural communities, the three things that are most important to Sarah Calhoun. That same year, the foundation also launched its first program, the Red Ants Pants Music Festival. In 2011, over 6,000 fans came to celebrate rural Montana in a cow pasture. In 2011, oh, and no, I already read that sentence. Over the years, attendees have enjoyed headlines including Merle Haggard, Emmylou Harris, Dwight Yoakam, and Winona Judd. The festival continues its success into the 10th year this year, July 23 through 26, 2020. And maybe I should say that again so you can all mark your calendars. July 23 through 26, 2020. I want to see somebody writing that down so you can go. Uh, it's so the Red Ants Pants Musical Festi Festival aims to improve upon authentic, rich community culture. And 16,000 attendees join, enjoyed the 2019 festival. Calhoun's grit has brought her, enterprise, brought her enterprise's national recognition, recognition over the years. In 2018, she was named Montana Business to the Montana Business Hall of Fame, and the festival received the prestigious Events of the Year Award from the Montana Office of Tourism and Business Development. She was honored when Governor Schweitzer named her the 2011 Entrepreneur of the Year for the state of, South Dakota, of, state of Montana. Calhoun and her company have been featured in many national publications, including Entrepreneur, National Geographic, Skies, uh, the Delta Sky Magazine, Country Women, and Sunset. And I have to say, in her bio, I cut out pages of events and honors that she's won. It's a lot. You ought to check her bio out for more. Calhoun has been called the rev a revolutionary figure in rural business today and a powerhouse of inspiration for women in business. Her dynamic style and inspiring experiences as an entrepreneur have made her a highly sought after keynote speaker. She's given two TED Talks, dozens of keynote addresses, and has been featured on nationwide TV programs such as CNBC, CNN, and Bloomberg. As Calhoun has written, risen to the top echelons of success as a rural entrepreneur, she's paying it forward by actively encouraging and mentoring other women in starting their own businesses. Calhoun spends her free time enjoying Montana's great outdoors, cutting firewood, hunting, and camping. But most importantly, she lives in White Sulphur, Sulphur Springs with her wonderful dog, Nellie. So we're very pleased to be able to welcome Sarah Calhoun to our stage today. So let's give, us, give Sarah a warm DW welcome to Dakota Western University.
right. Thank you, Bill. And thank you all so much for having me here. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, I really enjoyed the whole day getting to know all your students, and um, I think we have a bright future, that is for sure. So we're going to kick things off here, and I'm going to show you just a very quick clip. This is kind of where we started as a pants company. Um, this was the first commercial we ever made. There's some very high-paid actors in this, you will be able to quickly tell. Um, so we'll go ahead and hit this one and get a rolling. <laughs> No. Uh, not again. have fun with our company and I think that's what it's all about when it comes down to it. So I'm just going to share my story with you guys. Um, as, as you will quickly learn, I don't have a business background so this all came out of necessity and um, so starting with the pants company and then the music festival and then our nonprofit and all of the community excitement woven through so I hope you enjoy and we will have time for questions afterwards. Thank you. So women by nature are curvy, right? We come in all sorts of beautiful shapes and sizes. Men, on the other hand, not so curvy. Ever since the gold rush, women have been wearing men's pants when we need to get serious work done. Squeezing curvy women into square men's pants results in a number of problems. The worst of which is, of course, the dreaded plumber's crack. Never good for anyone, especially on a job site. So I was going through my own personal pants journey, trying to find work pants that fit. I grew up on a farm in Connecticut, received my degree in environmental studies from Gettysburg College, Pennsylvania, and went on to work for several years instructing for Outward Bound and leading trail crews across the country. And throughout this time, I was completely unsuccessful with my mission. I could not find a pair of pants that fit. I, went, I ended up wearing my dad's hand-me-downs and sewing my own pants. But I knew I wasn't the only woman struggling with this. I knew there were a lot of other women in the industry that needed good pants that functioned well and fit. So I talked to some other apparel companies and tried to get someone else to start a line of workwear for women. No one really jumped at it, and one guy said, well, if you're serious about it, why don't you start your own company? So at the age of 25, filled with a great deal of youthful, naive optimism, I said to myself, start a business? How hard could that be? Little did I know. So the first thing when starting a company is to find a name, right? So Red Ant's Pants popped into my head and it stuck. And who knows where I should be pointing this. Aha. So the name, Red Ant's Pants. It turns out that in an ant colony, 
it is the female ants that do all of the work. The male ants, they simply breed and die. <laughs> and that's a true story. <laughs> So in 2004, I moved to Bozeman, Montana. At this point, I didn't even know what a business plan was. So I did what every entrepreneur surely does and bought a copy of Small Business for Dummies, a great read. So my first weekend in Montana, I was reading this book at a local coffee shop and a guy noticed the book and we got to, got to visiting. And it turns out for the past 20 years, he had done production and design for a little company called Patagonia. Quite the fateful day. He took me to his shop a week later gave me loads of contacts and advice, and just said, Sarah, I think you're onto something big here. I think you need to move on this now. Richard Sibarel continues to be one of my top mentors, and he's on my board of advisors to this day. So those next two years flew by as I engrossed myself into learning everything I had to to start an apparel company. And let me just say that it is not typical for a young woman especially with zero experience or schooling in business, product design, textiles, manufacturing, and marketing to start a new clothing brand. I had a lot of work to do and a lot to learn. And yes, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. So I first got a job sewing backpacks to learn the technical production floor. I designed the pants, sourced the fabric and trims, wrote my business plan, established financing, and developed the website and marketing strategies. And at this point in time, I wanted to live in a small rural ag town, similar to where I grew up. I had just read a book called This House of Sky by Ivan Doig, one of the best writers of the American West. It sounded like a good town, so I moved into an old saddle shop on Main Street. And in 2006, I opened the doors to the international headquarters of Red Ants Pants. And the women cheered. So there were three things that I promised myself when I started this company. Number one, if I cannot run a business with integrity, I don't deserve to be in business. Nobody does. Number two, if I can't keep all of our production on US soil, then I don't want to run a clothing company. And number three, if I cannot make it personal and have fun connecting with my customers, then I don't even want to be in business. On paper, I'm an unlikely candidate to own a company. But with a strong work ethic, a good sense of right versus wrong, and just knowing how to treat people well, it is not that hard to run a business with integrity. So we contract with a mother and daughter owned factory in Seattle. Uh, they cut and sew all of our pants. And our shorts and our vests. Um, at Red Ants Pants, we will always keep our manufacturing in the USA, and that will not change. So at this point in time, I've got a company, a name, a product, and a storefront. But on a shoestring budget, how do we get the word out about Red Ants Pants? How do we teach people about a new brand? This is where making it personal and having fun comes into play. <clears throat> Tour de Pants, of course. So I got a hold of this old Airstream trailer, hired a tour rep, packed up my dog, and we took to the road and we did pants parties all over the US and Canada. It was a really neat way to connect with our customers and to hear their stories. But the best part was we had a beer sponsor. <laughs> so we do like to have fun with our marketing. We do demolition derbies, we do fashion shows on bars, we even built one time this bucking ant. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Miles City. It's a, a cow town in eastern Montana. And they have this event called the bucking horse sale every spring. Um, and Joel told me I could tell this story today. So hopefully it's not inappropriate for anyone's ears. Um, blame him if it is. <laughs> but uh, so it's, it's kind of like cowboy spring break, this event, right? So it's where all the, all the ranchers bring their green broke horses and the rodeo stock contractors come in and bid on the, the horses that are bucking the best for their, for their stock contracts. And, but there's all these street dances downtown. It's a big party. And I have this one pair of Red Ants pants that has Colt 45s appliqued on the hips. You know, these old time pistols, right? In this metallic fabric. They're kind of my party pants. And, uh, and I was wearing them downtown, completely minding my own business. And this big cowboy comes up to me, and he just humps my leg. And I, I look up at him, and he 
looks down at me and he goes, I just cocked your gun, ma'am. <laughs> like, yes, you did. <laughs> I was laughing so hard I didn't even punch him, so that was, that was a win. <laughs> but the really neat part about being in business is realizing that these pants are meaning something to our customers. They're becoming more than just a pair of pants. We received a letter from a customer who wore her Red Ants pants into surgery because they made her feel stronger. We had one biologist customer who was wearing her Red Ants pants in the back country and she got struck by a rattlesnake. And only the fang went through the top layer of the double knee and she was able to walk herself out seven miles. So we like to think Red Ants Pants, saving lives. <laughs> so one of the surprising things about my company though is how many men are now wearing women's work pants. <laughs> Not something I saw coming. We get questioned all the time. Why pants just for women? So this is what we say. Hello, hello to all you men out there. Many have asked, pants just for women? That's no fair. Well, here's our response, so listen up well. If you like this idea, a great story you'll tell. See, a hardworking man should not be shy to pull on our pants and give them a try. You don't need curves or well-rounded hips, for we've got a straight cut that'll bring a smile to your lips. So line up, fellas, now here's your chance we're finally going to let you into our pants. <laughs> I love telling that one when my father is in the audience. It's <laughs> we're winning. <laughs> so that's the first chapter, all about the pants. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about the broader community and how the place where I chose to live and work has influenced this story. This is the more personal side. And as I am learning, the fundamental meaning of all of this work comes down to the human connection. So you remember how I decided to live in the middle of nowhere because I read about it in a book? Well, here's why. Ivan Doig wrote this of his hometown, White Sulphur Springs, Montana, from his memoir, This House of Sky. It is not known just when in the 1860s, the first white pioneers trickled into our area of South Central Montana into what would come to be called the Smith River Valley. But if the earliest of them wagoned in on a day when the warm sage smell met the nose and the clear air lensed close the details of peaks two days ride from there, what a glimpse into glory it must have seemed. A glimpse into glory indeed. Doig's description grabbed me. I first read this back when I was in Bozeman working from my bedroom office. This continued from Doig. Whatever the prospects might seem in a dreamy look around, the settlers were trying a slab of lofty country, which often would be too cold and dry for their crops, too open to a killing winter for their cattle and sheep. It might take a bad winter or a late and rainless spring to bring out this fact, and the valley people did their best to live with calamity whenever it descended. But over time, the altitude, the valley floor sits over a mile high, and the climate added up pitilessly. And even after a generation or so of trying the valley, a settling family might take account and find that the most plentiful things around them were sagebrush and wind. Montana holds much romanticism and cachet, and for good reason. But truth be told, this landscape is equally as tough as it is majestic, as harsh as it is visually stunning. And Doig didn't breeze over that. He told the truth, sagebrush and wind. I knew then that I wanted to live there. I wanted to know these ranchers and the descendants of these settlers. I wanted authentic Montana, and I sure got it. White Sulphur Springs is a 900-person ranching town located 100 miles from any city. It is the county seat of Mar County. Doig told stories of the Stockman Bar and the bullet holes that can still be found within. Bullets from the wild days that were not all that long ago. I'm not sure what exactly about this appealed to me. Perhaps the wildness, the fact that white sulfur felt somehow more old fashioned than most places. Or perhaps it was because it felt as though anything were possible. 
I got the sense that in a town like this, no one tells you what to do or what not to do. I renovated the old brick saddle shop to reveal the original tin ceiling tiles from 1880. I settled into the living quarters directly behind the shop and even have two apartments upstairs for rental income. And the best part is, it is only 17 steps from my front door to the Stockman Bar. <laughs> Perfect, I had found my place. That first winter though, I had chimney fires and frozen pipes. My toilet bowl literally froze solid. I had one tenant bring bloody bar fights home and the other tenant had his gun go off and a bullet lodge in his leg while upstairs. I remember the first Chamber of Commerce meeting I attended. The Economist had just released a report that listed Mar County as the county with the lowest income of any in the entire nation. Local business owners were up in arms with frustration and disbelief. I recall my only comment that day was, well, it's only up from here. <laughs> White Sulphur is the kind of town where for generations, its inhabitants have been shaped by the landscape, moved by the mountain views, yet hardened by the wind. The raw winters keep a person honest. It's the kind of place where you need a lot of grit, hard work, and dependable friends and neighbors to make it. The work ethic that flows through the blood of these people runs as deep as the Smith River in its canyon walls. Ben Bullington, a dear friend and recently deceased songwriter, was the town doctor for many years. His song, White Sulphur Springs, sums up this place well. Dreams don't come easy on seven bucks an hour. Maybe it's a matter of what kind of dreams you have. The trout streams and the air is clean and money don't mean everything in a place called White Sulphur Springs. Ben always told me I should write the book on how to move into a rural community. But honestly, I was just being human. I was lonely and scared. Trying to start an apparel company is hard enough with no experience, but trying to do it in a town where I didn't know a soul was even harder. So I did the only thing I knew how to do. I pitched in. I volunteered as an EMT on the ambulance, joined the Arts Council, coached volleyball, helped out at local brandings and cattle drives. I got to know the people. And slowly but surely, they learned to trust this outsider and took me in. I love that small towns and rural areas, they force us to find commonalities with people we otherwise wouldn't. We need each other. And it makes our character a whole lot richer. So in 2011, I was named Entrepreneur of the Year by our governor. In 2012, I was named by the Small Business Administration, the National Woman in Business Champion. I was also invited to the White House, all incredible honors. But the meaning of this didn't sink in until I returned to White Sulphur from DC. I headed to the Stockman for a burger. There was a shipping party going on, so the place was packed with ranchers. And unbeknownst to me, the local paper had written up a piece on my going to the White House. There must have been a dozen different ranchers that came up that night, slapped me on the back, and simply said, Sarah, you've made us proud. When I think about leadership, I think about authenticity. I think about building genuine relationships, and I think about community. So after about five years in business, We've survived the economic downturn. We're hiring more and more employees in rural Montana, but I realized we needed a big marketing push on the pants company side. It seemed time to bring folks together on a larger scale. It's time to celebrate. So I decided to throw a party, a big party as it turned out. July of 2011, in a cow pasture just outside of town, 6,000 fans came to the first ever Red Ants Pants Music Festival. This tripled the county's population. <laughs> it was by far the riskiest move of my life. I was working off a zero dollar budget, hoping that we could sell enough advance tickets so that I could pay the talent deposits. And very fortunately, it worked. The community rallied hugely around the event and it literally took the whole town to pull it off. Ranchers lent their land, augers, mowers, even helicopters. High school groups earned money picking rocks and filling in gopher holes. The football team collected trash throughout the weekend. 
The county crews watered the dirt roads. The city supported our efforts with fire, EMS, and law enforcement. We had a core crew of staff and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. None of us knew what to expect that first year. It was like a field of dreams. I can remember the first day we opened the festival campground, and I couldn't believe my eyes when I looked up and I saw the line of cars and trucks and campers and sheep wagons going down the valley for miles and miles as far as you could see. We built it, and they came. We literally bought out the toilet paper supply for three counties across. <laughs> but the best part about the festival is that it brings people together. You give them good music, good beer, and an incredible landscape, and they cannot help but to connect. So one of my favorite pictures from the festival is two, two men standing with their backs to the camera. They don't appear to know each other well. They're just having a beer and enjoying the show. And on the back of one guy's shirt, it reads, Save the Planet. And the other guy, who must have worked for an asphalt company, his shirt read, Pave the Planet. <laughs> you can't make that up. Um, another great one I was telling today in one of the classes was, um, we, we literally get all types of people at the festival. And there was this one big biker, burly dude up front. And someone was watching him. And uh, you know he's wearing his leather cuts and this, uh, uh, you know, this leather vest and over a tank top that just says, I eat hippies. <laughs> and unbeknownst to him, the next band about to take the stage was this guy named Todd Snyder, who is from East Nashville, and he is as hippie as they come. He performs barefoot. He had just gotten kicked out of the hotel for smoking weed. Um, and he comes on stage, and the crowd just goes wild for him. And this biker kind of steps back and looks to his right and looks to his left, and then very slowly zips up his vest. <laughs> it's so good. So our, our uh, town sheriff, with whom I work very closely on the festival, at the end of that first year, he sent me a text and he just goes, awesome job, Sarah. I'll never arrest you for anything. <laughs> it's like, save. <laughs> oh. All right, so one of the things that sets our festival apart from other music events is our demonstration area. So we do demos on traditional agricultural and work skills, including sheepdog trials, ranch horsemanship, crosscut saw competitions, and the ever popular meat cutting. We also do trailer backing taught by women, which is, which is a pretty fun one. Um, but the meat cutting consists of a hind quarter of a cow, of a beef hanging off a tractor, and then this old time butcher comes in and starts slicing it up passes it over to the head chef from a big restaurant in Bozeman who throws it on the grill and the crowd gets to have a, have a bite so you can see why it's popular. But the first year we did this demo, the butcher cuts off this big chunk of meat. It slips and hits the dirt. So he picks it up, trims it off, and carries on. And it was overheard in the crowd, some guy saying, man, this is awesome. The only place you can find this is Montana or Mexico. <laughs> we must be doing something right. But perhaps the most important element of the festival is that it is a program of and a fundraiser for the Red Ants Pants Foundation. So this is the nonprofit branch. Our foundation is in support of women's leadership, working family farms and ranches, and rural communities. Our values include cultivating a strong work ethic, encouraging self-reliance, maintaining traditional work skills, and my personal favorite, providing opportunities for people with different perspectives to connect, build bridges, and discover common ground. Pretty essential these days, especially. We have awarded an eight-year total of over $115,000 through our grant cycle with proceeds from the festival. And this goes to individuals and programs across the region whose projects parallel our mission. One of my favorite grantees is Dropstone Outfitters. It's the only... Uh, female-owned outfitter in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, based out of Shoto, Montana. And we gave them a grant to purchase a mule. They did a, a, then a naming competition for this said mule, and they chose Calhoun. So now I have a mule named after me, and I think it might be time to reach out, retire. It's one of my proudest accomplishments to date. <laughs> one way we promote the festival is hiding these large red ants in rural towns across Montana. Our fans then seek them out to enter a VIP contest. We call it Montanta. The idea is to encourage people to support our small towns. 
The first year, I started just cold calling people to see if they wanted to host a nine-foot ant sticker at their business. And the guy who owns the huge grain elevator in Haver up on the High Line, he goes, you want to do what now? Next thing I know, I'm standing on the top of a very rickety 20-foot wooden ladder with my colleague Bree next to me. We had an enormous vinyl sticker, nine feet wide, flapping in the wind as we struggled to get this ant off the backing and stuck on the elevator without falling. This was certainly not OSHA approved. But the one thing that saved us that day was a very sweet older woman named Marla Ray. She had come to town to meet us to receive her grant check from our foundation for the Big Sandy Library. Upon arriving, she quickly saw that we needed help. She spent the next hour holding our ladders so we could get this ant up safely. We laughed about the whipping wind and about why ants have to have so many darn legs. We cried about how important libraries are for the vitality of rural communities. She held us up in every way. And that is what I continue seeing across this state and the region. We hold each other up when the wind starts blowing. We hold each other up when the ladders start swaying. Another one of our grants went to Garfield County to help with fire education and training. In their application, they said, Jordan is a community where the word neighbor is a verb. I couldn't agree more. I believe the whole region understands and practices neighboring. We need each other. When I think about philanthropy, I immediately think about money. But I would argue that it really has very little to do with money. Money is a tool we need to use to get our good work done. And don't get me wrong, we all hugely appreciate the financial donations, but philanthropy is Greek for the love of people, goodwill, humanism. Charity means love in the sense of unconditional loving kindness, compassion, and seeking to do good. This is something everyone in this room lives by. The other programs of our Red Ants Pants Foundation include Timber Skills, which is a four-day carpentry and chainsaw training for women. And our newest program is Girls Leadership. So this is a year-long program for eight rural girls every year in their junior year of high school. It includes a mentorship and a community project. Our goal is to instill hope for our youth, pride in their rural communities, and strength and courage in their leadership. And I'm very intentionally trying to build a good old girls club. So the first time ever, we have now started doing some external fundraising so we can broaden our reach. So if any of you have any interest in investing in our young women to be tomorrow's leader, dare I say even the president someday, let's talk. So in recent years, we've had over 18,000 people attend our festival. Headliners have included Merle Haggard, Emmylou Harris, Dwight Yoakam, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Winona, and Charlie Pride. The governor's office and Department of Commerce wrote an economic impact study on the festival. They predicted that up to $2.8 million would change hands during the weekend of the 2013 festival, many years ago. And that's just the weekend. That's not the secondary and tertiary effects we're now seeing in our community year-round. I can't say for sure that our economy has improved, but we now have a new brewery, a new gear store, new restaurants, new streets and sidewalks, a new barn quilt trail, a new school, and a new library. And we are no longer listed as the county with the lowest income in the nation. So a few winters back, I received a letter from Ivan Doig himself, a real handwritten letter on actual stationery. It was enclosed with a copy of his recent book. He had heard about Red Ant's Pants and of his influence on my settling in White Sulphur Springs. He told me he was really glad I had found his hometown and am making it perk. So here's to making it perk in all of our hometowns. This was a welcome letter I wrote for our festival newspaper. Thank you for being here and for being an integral part of making this field of dreams rise to life. Thank you for the hard work that you do and for making time to come and celebrate. These mountains have been here a long, long time. They have been silently watching we humans in this valley for hundreds of years now. They have watched us make peace with warring tribes to share the healing hot springs. They have watched us build homesteads and one-room schoolhouses. They have watched us pull silver, gold, and copper from these rich veins and timber from these dense forests. 
They have watched us raise sheep and horses and the best black Angus steaks you'll ever taste. And now these mountains look down upon us today. Let's show them that there is a hell of a lot of hope for humanity. That having a little integrity, a strong work ethic, and a big heart is really all we need. To be good neighbors, good families, and good people. And that we can all come together in this sweet clover cow pasture and just be human. Enjoy. Enjoy yourself, but even more importantly, enjoy each other. So we have an ad campaign with the pants company. There it is. Um, and it is profiling the different kick-ass women of history. We started with Sacagawea, and this reads, Sacagawea, at 17, she led the 33 men of the Lewis and Clark expedition through the Rocky Mountains with a baby on her back. Interpreter, wilderness guide, working mother. Step into these pants and see what you can do. And so I will leave you with this. Step into these pants, or into whichever pants fit you the best. And whatever good work it is that you do, perhaps you'll stand a little bit taller, work a little bit harder, and maybe walk with a little more pride in your step. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think we're gonna play a quick um, documentary film, and this was put together by uh, Montana Television Network. It's called Under the Big Sky, um, just to give you a little bit of visuals of White Sulphur Springs and the music festival, and then I think we'll have time for a few questions. We're all to welcome you to Mar County, the greatest thing that had ever come to Mar County, Sarah Calhoun. We never had a gathering like this in Mar County since we struck gold in Diamond City. Is there anybody else who understands? We're all just trying to find some value in our work and our lives, really. Like, what are we doing all this for? People want to be part of something good and worthwhile and positive. The Red Ants Pants Foundation is funded by our music festival fully. It's really fun to be able to have a party in a cow pasture and then give some money away to worthwhile projects across the state. That first year, none of us knew what to expect. We literally ended up buying out the entire toilet paper supply across three counties. Hey, buddy, everybody, how are we doing out there? Yeah. This past year, we had 16,000 attendees to our town of 900 people that emotional experience that goes on between the music and the sunsets and the wind and the crowd. We're using music as a very powerful tool to bring people together, and that's the kind of stuff that's worthwhile in my mind. That was that was just the beginning, but we can. We all want to welcome you to Mar County, the greatest thing that had ever come to my business. Do you love America? I grew up on a farm in rural Connecticut. I spent about five years leading trail crews all across the country. And in that time, I got pretty fed up with not finding any pants that fit. You end up wearing men's pants because that's all that was available at the time. One guy said, if you're serious about it, why don't you start your own company? So at the age of 25, I very naively said to myself, start a business, how hard could that be? <laughs> and little did I know. After my last trail crew, I decided to move to Montana. I had never been here. I had just read Ivan Doig's book about growing up here in White Sulphur Springs. It sounded like a good place to be, so I came to visit one time, found this old saddle shop for sale, and moved up here. I started volunteering as an EMT with the ambulance and coach volleyball and worked with the Arts Council and the Chamber and all that just to get to know the town and to have something to do. Sooner or later, they were like, oh, all right, I think she's 
she's all right, you know, <laughs> and I felt pretty welcomed in. From a wall of solid granite. It took a full two years before we got into production and opened the doors. A lot of learning how to source textiles, do all the contract cut and sew, which everything's made in the U.S. I had the doors open to the international headquarters of Red Ant's Pants. And now I have pants that fit. <laughs> Integrity is number one. Like if we're not treating our customers well and treating our employees well and treating our community well on a broader spectrum, then we shouldn't be in business. They say that, oh, it's business, it's not personal. I think it should be personal. We treat people so much better when we know them and we know their story. So I think we need to do more of that. The success of a business should not be just determined by how quickly have you made how much money. I mean, that's what's gotten us to where we are right now. And why do businesses have to be huge? Let's celebrate the small businesses where you still have relationships with your customers, with your vendors, with your suppliers, with your town. There's a lot more strength in that long term. Everything in this journey thus far, it's allowed me to figure out what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. The reality is the pants company is going to continue and it's going to exist and we'll keep putting out great new products. My skill set is not sales and manufacturing and running a business. Even with the festival now that we've kind of got that dialed in and that will certainly continue and be well sustained. I'm ready for the next challenge, the next idea. I want to have my focus turned more towards the foundation. I think there's so much potential there. We have a Red Ant grant program every spring where we take proceeds from the festival and give money directly to individuals and organizations who have projects that parallel our mission. Women's leadership, working family farms and ranches and rural communities all the things that I really value and find important. We've given away $65,000 now. It's starting to build momentum in ways that I wouldn't have expected. Gives you a lot of hope. <laughs> the line just keeps going through my head that there is strength in our togetherness. When we all work together on a larger, really big project, like a music festival, like who would think we could pull that off in a town of 900? But when everyone pitches in and works really hard towards a common goal, it just, it happens. Just remembering that little lesson on the broader scheme of the world, it's gonna be much more powerful and impactful. It always comes down to Calhoun, you have a gift and you have a voice and people are listening and you need to use it more than I am now. There's not a large gap between kind of the introverted Sarah and the extroverted Sarah. My work is just an extension of these ideas. The dreams don't come easy. I think about these things and I feel these things all the time. People recognize that it, it is real and true and who I am. I think the honesty carries through. That's my hope anyway. Got streams and the air's clean. And money don't mean everything. I think our circumstances in our world are gonna change and, and I think we're gonna need really strong leaders. I often find myself writing down how lucky I am to have such good people around. What really draws me into White Sulphur in particular is that it's there's a lot of wind and grit out here and it's not as easy and lovely as it is portrayed, but that almost makes it more worthwhile to me. Within these places, I think the human spirit is exemplified in ways that we don't see everywhere. And that is what's truly important.
<coughs> we'd love to have student questions or any questions from anyone. So what questions do you have for Sarah? Did I see a hand back here? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, starting your business, obviously a big trial and everything. Uh, you're very energetic and happy about it. At what point did it seem like things were really bearing on you and then it was a sudden shift that brought this positivity? Because I'm sure there was a lot of negatives in the beginning that really pushed on you? Do you have a, a defining moment that it really changed? You know, I think I've, I'm generally pretty optimistic, which is helpful for sure. And yes, entrepreneurs uh, usually have a lot of energy. Um, I wouldn't say there's a defining moment. It's, um, it is a lot of work starting a business, sustaining a business, starting a nonprofit, sustaining a nonprofit, running a music festival, all of it, it takes a tremendous amount of work. But, um, and there's plenty of moments where I'm wondering what the heck I got myself into and how I'm going to get out of it. And, you know, we spend a lot of time alone in the middle of the night, awake from two to three in the morning, wondering about certain problems. But, but that's all part of the game, right? And I, I think um, just being honest with ourselves about our capacity and making sure to take care of ourselves and just continue to work really, really hard is, is the name of the game for me anyway. Other questions for Sarah today? I will throw in a quick commercial break while you're yeah. going there in that um, reddancepants.com, 15% off to all of you if you would like to purchase anything. And the code is DWU2020. So <laughs> DWU2020, check it out. Hi. Hi. Uh, you spoke about how uh, your community is very small and there isn't really anything around in terms of a population. How did you find your labor force? Great question. So we've been very fortunate with the pants company that I haven't ever even had to put an ad out for to running a job. Um, we have one full-time store manager, and that role has turned over a couple times, mostly due to pregnancies, and and then probably six part-time store helpers, um, all all local, and they've just come to us. Really, we've been very lucky. It's not it's not a huge not huge volume yet, certainly. Although I find that in small towns in rural Montana, there are there's typically a pretty good workforce, at least for um, at least for managing a store and doing distribution. Uh, my communications and PR director, she's out of Missoula and works remotely, and another strategic gal is out of Bozeman. Similarly, um, we contract with them, and then our festival staff are scattered all across the state and in town, um, and then all the event you know 90 event staff come from all over to help help work as well, and 220 volunteers. So. Certainly takes an takes an army of ants, but um, but yeah, we've we've been very fortunate with our workforce recruitment in town. Other questions? So not everything right in town, but we, we contract with a cut and sew facility in Seattle that they make our pants, our shorts, and our vests and our work shirts right now. Our leather belts and our work aprons and our custom hemming is all done right in town, the hemming in-house. And what we're actually working on right now, there's a new, a new cut and sew operation opening in Billings, Montana, and they want to sew some red ants pants. So we're hoping to shift our production into the state at least, which will be fantastic. But so you're shipping, are you also shipping from your home yep, community? Exactly. We do we do all of our distribution and our online fulfillment right in our storefront. Yep. Two oh six East I Maine. Have one more question. What is the fiber content of the pants themselves? Yep. So our original work pant is hundred percent cotton. It's a twelve ounce cotton canvas duck. And our new GSD, our get stuff done pant, is a little bit lighter weight. It's a ten ounce and that has two percent elastic. So there's a little stretch in there which is Fantastic, if I say so myself. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is so cool. Uh, thank you for coming to Mitchell. Um, I, so a retail store in a town of 900 um, strikes me as somewhat limited customer <laughs> contact points. So how have you reached the, I mean, I assume you sell more than just Tamar County. Mm -hmm. how, how do you reach those people 
um, other than through the music festival? Mm -hmm. Great question. So, so readyonspants.com is clearly where we do the majority of our of our sales. Um, White Sulphur actually has incredibly high powered internet, like faster than Billings and Bozeman combined. Really, um, go rural. Yep, go rural exactly. And I think that was through a USDA grant a couple of years ago. Um, but we, so as far as the actual getting the pants out to the people, other than bringing everyone in for the festival and now year round, the town is booked. We have a hot springs and we have a ski hill and the Smith River and great hunting and fishing. So now we have to see a lot more tourism annually. Um, but what we, we do since I, I haven't done the tour to pants model for a while, but we do, we started doing pop-up shops, um, collaborating with other small businesses, other gear shops in the bigger towns, because people do really want to try on the product um, for sure. So that's been, that's been really neat to see. But, and I, you know, they used to say location, location, location for, for a storefront, but um, the combo of a brick and mortar and online is working really well for us. And I think there, again, there's so much potential in small towns when you do have a workforce, high quality of living, low cost of living, great historic buildings on Main Street that need to be preserved. Um, there's typically, you know, FedEx, UPS, and USPS at least that come through. And um, I just think the potential for entrepreneurship and small business in rural towns should really be celebrated and encouraged big time. Your, your music festival sounds awesome and it almost sounds like you're now a music festival that also has a retail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and chainsaw true. classes it, all yeah, at and once. Chainsaw yeah. classes and timber <laughs> yeah. classes. Is, yep. is, is that okay? Um, it seems to be. So Red Ants Pants um, pays for a booth space to the foundation like all the other craft vendors do. So that's, I mean, it's, it ends up being, you know, we, we haul our pants out there and set up a little pop-up shop as well. Um, we have a lot of art and craft and um, vendors as well as food vendors. So that's, what, that's how that and, goes. And my last question is, what, what was your favorite failure so far? Oh, my favorite failure. Goodness. Um, I think the biggest challenge certainly is um, just I, finance is not my strong suit. And I, I constantly am, I, I feel like an imposter in that world, even at this point, which is, which is very tricky. Um, and you have to you have to understand your balance sheet. And it's taken me a lot of years to figure that out and working with a contract CFO and trying to, trying to do that more. Um, I think a big failure was not having a really good numbers person at the beginning. I think I would have been able to get a lot further than I am now on the pants side. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about, have you ever thought about utilizing social media to do your advertising and stuff like that? Yes, absolutely. We, we do use Facebook, uh, Instagram. We do a little Twitter, but not much. Um, but that has been a, a huge help with our marketing. And, and as you know, it's, a, it's pretty much free unless you have to pay for it. But um, that's been a great outlet, both for the, the pants company and the festival and the foundation. So, and we try to interweave the three as well. Yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. We can always use uh, more help and millennial tips. So if you want an internship, call me. Yeah. Other questions? Ah. So since there are a lot of college students in the room right now, I have a question about um, how you envisioned your life when you were a college student and what you know now, and if there's any advice you <coughs> have for all of these college students as they're thinking about their lives five, ten years in the future, you know, what are things that they should consider today? Absolutely, great question. Um, so I studied environmental science and I definitely wanted to save the world at that age. And I looked down on the business and marketing students and thinking I was totally judgy, like, oh, they just want to make money. And here I am now, <laughs> having never taken a business class still. Um, but I think, I think the big thing is with both in, in college, obviously we're learning not necessarily the content of a major, but you're learning how to communicate well and to think strategically and the full humanities approach is super valuable for anything that you're gonna do. So take as many classes in different areas as you can while in school. Beyond that, I think a few things for, and I'm sure there's a lot of different pressures now about immediately getting a job and worrying about student debt and all of that, but, but I think trying as many different types of jobs even if it's waitressing or bartending or cleaning public campgrounds, you know, like anything you do, you're gonna be learning some sort of a skill. My personal rule was always, as long as I'm learning something new, it's a worthwhile job, right? Um, and the other one, I would, I would spend time out of the country if at all possible at any point in your life. 
Um, it gets harder and harder the older you get, but whether it's a study abroad program or, or just going on exchange or just, just traveling outside of the country, I think that's a really valuable way, especially for those of us growing up rural, to look back and have a new perspective on our, on our world. And we are going to Peru and Israel. If you want to go to Israel, uh, you can <laughs> talk to me. We're planning a trip right now. So uh, anyone else have a question? I was intrigued by your, your story. How do you keep your styles and your ideas and your, you know, your different lines of clothing, how do you keep in evolving that? <laughs> I don't always, is the truth. <laughs> um, and, and my problem, honestly, has been capacity just internally because I, I have that classic curse of an entrepreneur where I want to keep starting a new project every year and um, don't necessarily take care of the last project that I haven't finished. So the pants company got neglected for a couple years because the festival just took off and I, all my resources were going there. Um, so it's been, it's been touch and go. Again, that, you know, our original work pant, our brown cotton canvas duck has been unchanged for 14 years and it's not till this past spring when we launched this lighter weight gray pant. Um, we also, we've been adding other types of products and whatnot, but the ones that we really design and manufacture are wool vest, our moleskin work shirt, um, our leather belt and buckle, and now, now we're starting to do more and more styles of pant. So stay tuned for what's coming next. I guess I'm up <clears throat> where you're, you're really impactful and the, tr the connection that we, I think everyone probably has with you and your, your dream's super evident. I guess my biggest question for you, why aren't you writing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, why am I not writing? Is yeah, that what you said? You'd be a, I mean, you'd be a fantastic writer. I mean, you sing to my soul. I mean. I'm a super avid reader, but some of the things that I read through your dream, it's like absolutely amazing and it's super inspiring. So I just wanted you to know that. Well, thank you so much. And I am, I am trying in vain to find time to work on the book very slowly. So, but I appreciate that validation. Thank you. Other questions? Fine. Student, Caleb, you got a question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mary. Sarah, I have one more question for you, but it seems to me that when you talk about the chainsaw classes, mm -hmm. are any of your pants reinforced for safety <laughs> for those who work with chainsaws? So, so cotton canvas will not do it, but we do, steel is our main sponsor, and we do have um, chaps that all the students use 100%, yes. Oh. Um, and steel actually wanted to know if we would start a line of women's women's chaps because they don't, I mean, you know, they're huge and they're men's, that, um, but we, we absolutely require those, those personal protective equipment pieces, yes. Um, but Red Ants pants with, that would, you know, the, in the, the chap form, they're fantastic. Um, we have been t looking at maybe different uh, Nomex wildfire and FR pants for the firefighters, that sort of thing, um, for sure. Fantastic, good for yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. We have time for one more, two more. Oh, Joe. So if <laughs> <laughs> I sense trouble from no, this no, guy. No, no, no trouble. <laughs> um, so if, so if uh, for for the people in the audience who have no curves at all, like myself, mm. what what is the style that we should order? <laughs> so that's the straight cut. So straight, straight cut. cut's pretty linear. Curvy has more room in the seat and thighs. And lots of men are now wearing the straight cut. The fly is a little bit shorter, but folks can make do. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? I'm going to leave <laughs> that alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had one more. So the, the documentary, which that's awesome, by the way. Proud of you. So where can people find that? I was so, Googling it, and I can't find it. Oh, that's good to know. So that is, um, the series is called Under the Big Sky. Okay. And I don't know, it's all programmed by Montana Television Network, and I think it is definitely online. I think it's under Vimeo, um, if, you, if you look that up. Under the Big Sky is the documentary series, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for Thanks. being here. Thanks for having me.
How about one more question? A student question. We haven't had a student question for a while. They had like a million questions all day. Yeah, that's right, day. that's <laughs> right. You've been asked, okay, great, right here in the front. Which they did a great job with. What has been like your um, top sales in like the years, that, like have you, when you started? Like what was your top year sale? So actually our biggest year as far as percentage growth was the first year of the music festival. We went up 100% in sales, so that was a big one and we've been, we've been going steadily up and kind of dribbling along ever since. <laughs> so next year is gonna be a really good one. I have a feeling. So. Well, let's thank Sarah for coming to Dakota West University. Thank you. And, and thank you very much for coming out to our Stark Lectureship. Have a good evening.